America has been plagued with unspeakable crimes and unexplained phenomena that have captured nationwide attention and intrigue, demanding answers and retribution. However, many of these mysteries never get explained. Mysteries to this day that are still thwarting the best efforts of countless law enforcement and investigative teams. Serial killers never identified. Treasures lost. Murderers never caught. And conspiracy upon conspiracy spinning into tangled webs of inconclusive evidence and unresolved truths. This compelling documentary series presents a countdown of America's 60 most notorious unsolved mysteries and crimes in a dramatic compilation revealing these unanswered questions in 10 fascinating episodes. Let's look at numbers 39 to 33, a dazzling combination of mysteries. The greatest unsolved art theft in history, a strange coincidence of UFOs and American rocketry at Roswell, New Mexico, the unexplained death of America's first mystery writer, Edgar Allan Poe, and Bigfoot. Since its founding, mysterious deaths have been part of the mystique of Hollywood, particularly beautiful women dying under gruesome circumstances. Such was the case of the 1920s and 30s big screen blonde bombshell, Thelma Todd. Where is the guy that's putting on this brawl? Who wants to know? Eleanor Despair, the personality girl. Todd was born in 1906. A bright student, she intended to become a school teacher. But in her late teens, she began entering beauty pageants, winning the title of Miss Massachusetts in 1925. It was while representing her home state that a movie talent scout spotted her. And the rest is a classic Hollywood story. During the silent era, Todd appeared in many supporting roles that made full use of her beauty. With the advent of the talkies, she expanded her roles when producer Hal Roach signed her to appear with such comedy legends as Harry Langdon, Charlie Chase, and Laurel and Hardy. Thelma Todd quickly became a highly sought-after film comedienne and was soon playing opposite Wheeler and Woolsey, Buster Keaton, Joe E. Brown, and the Marx Brothers. In August 1934, Thelma opened a successful restaurant in Pacific Palisades. Called Thelma Todd's Sidewalk Cafe, it attracted Hollywood's elite celebrities. Life was going well, maybe too well. Everyone says I love you. The cop on the corner and the burglar too. The preacher on the morning of December 16th, 1935, Thelma Todd was found dead in her car inside the garage of Jewel Carmen, a former actress and former wife of Todd's business partner, Roland West. 
Carmen's house was approximately a block from Todd's restaurant. The detectives of the LAPD concluded immediately that her death was accidental. They stated that Todd was either warming the car to drive it or using the heater to keep herself warm. We all know how cold it is in L.A. It seems like sort of an odd thing for somebody to turn on a car and sit in it there and wait, you know, and die in the garage uh, by accident. I honestly believe that Thelma Todd was, was probably murdered. Now, the, the, it was ruled an accident. They said that she fell asleep uh, in her car with it, with it running, um, and that's what killed her, was asphyxiation from the fumes. Uh, but there were several odd things that happened around that time, um, including some things that occurred between her and Roland West, who was a, a business partner of hers, and uh, a former director that she had worked with, um, and may have been involved with him in a personal affair. Um, it's said that his ex-wife, Joel Carmen, was um, a, a little mentally unstable and that she may have had it in for Thelma, uh, who was, you know, somebody that was well-liked and, and thought of as really one of the, the funniest comedians uh, in America in those days. Uh, she had a very popular cafe on the Pacific Coast Highway, lived in a, in a small apartment up above it uh, on the Palisades. Uh, the garage where she died uh, was nearby, and it's said that when they discovered her body, she had been badly beaten, um, something that, that got left out of some of the reports. Uh, but in the photographs, you can actually see that she, her face had been bloodied. Some people said she slumped over and hit the steering wheel, but uh, a couple of her teeth had even been knocked out. It looked like she had been worked over pretty good and then been left in a, in a running car. Uh, my th that's my opinion, is that's what happened, because uh, I believe that she, like so many others, crossed the wrong person. Uh, at that time, uh, the, the syndicate was working to make inroads into Hollywood. They were looking for locations uh, where they could set up gambling joints because there, there really wasn't a lot of organized crime in Hollywood, especially in the early days. Uh, and it was a wide open market, especially for the gambling and the gambling ships and the, and the different restaurants. And um, it was said that Lucky Luciano came to Thelma and asked her if he could set up a gambling joint at her cafe, and she turned him down flat, didn't want any part of it. Um, in fact, uh, he came to her several times, and every time she turned him down. Uh, there were a lot of men, a lot bigger and stronger than Thelma Todd, who didn't turn down the mob, but Thelma did. And uh, it's said that Luciano threatened her on this final time, that if she didn't do it, she'd be sorry. Um, not long afterwards, she ends up beaten and left in a running car inside of her garage. From somewhere, they come up with a theory that uh, Lucky Luciano, the gangster from New York, had her killed because either she wouldn't participate in some kind of underworld sex orgies or she wouldn't allow him to put gambling devices uh, into uh, her restaurant slash nightclub. Uh, to me, that seems kind of thin. First, there's no evidence that uh, Luciano ever came to California, although he wouldn't have had to personally certainly come out and gas her in the garage. It would have been somebody more like Bugsy Siegel or Mickey Cohen or Jack Dragna. But it just seems like a, a very strange thing for the Mafia to be involved with if someone uh, that, uh, that prominent in Hollywood to kill them because they wouldn't let you put in slot machines in their restaurant. It seems a little odd. Also, some suspicion, I think, fell on her ex-husband, who was a bootlegger of some nature and was known to be violently abusive toward women. And when he remarried, I believe his second wife uh, implicated that she had some knowledge about uh, him killing Thelma, but it never came out as far as a trial. Like all good Hollywood murder mysteries, and this was clearly a murder, perhaps they're best left unsolved. For her contribution to the motion picture industry, Thelma Todd was given a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame at 6262 Hollywood Boulevard. Stop by sometime. Pay your respects. are only eight little letters in this phrase.
And you can see it. It's on the video. It's on the film, the highlight film of the game. He clearly makes a gesture. Every baseball fan knows the name Babe Ruth. The record-setting power hitter is still considered not only the best baseball player in history, but one of the country's greatest sports heroes of all time. George Herman Ruth Jr., known as the Babe, was America's first sports superstar, an athlete everyone admired. He played in the major leagues for 21 years, from 1914 to 1935, and was the first player to hit 60 home runs in a single season, amassing a staggering lifetime total of 714. His record earned him the nickname the Sultan of Swat. He was a World Series champion and unparalleled seven times. While Ruth was playing for the New York Yankees during the 1932 World Series, one of the greatest mysteries of baseball occurred, a mystery that helped make Babe Ruth a legend. It is a story that fans continue to debate today. Did the Babe call his shot? In Game 3 of the 1932 World Series against the Chicago Cubs, that's when Babe Ruth supposedly called his shot, gesturing out to the outfield stands and then hitting a home run following that. A crucial home run in the World Series is itself a guarantee of fame. Ruth's called shot, where he not just, not just chose the pitch on which he, which he was going to hit out of the park, but where he pointed to the spot where he was going to hit it. This was clearly a story destined for immortality. You would think it would be easy to figure out whether it was a true story. I mean, after all, there were 50,000 50, witnesses in Wrigley Field that day. There were sports writers from across the country. And Ruth himself always maintained that he pointed before the pitch. Yet from the start, there were skeptics. Among the skeptics were the two Cub players closest to the action. Gabby Hartnett, the Cub catcher, said that Ruth did point, but he pointed not to the bleachers, but to the Cub dugout where Cub fans were riding him. And Charlie Root, the Cub pitcher, always vehemently denied that Ruth pointed to the bleachers. But is he really calling his shot or is he sort of being threatening towards the pitcher or, or uh, complaining towards the Cubs bench? There was some bad blood at this point between the Babe and the team that they were playing in the World Series. So it's not at all clear that he's really calling his shot. But a reporter, a New York reporter sees it that way. That's what he writes in his headline, Babe Ruth called his shot and that's how it's gone down in history. Babe Ruth was an incredible athlete. You know, it's easy to look at him and say, oh, he's a roly-poly guy, kind of a funny figure. Um, but he was a wickedly good athlete and he was a very fierce competitor. And I don't doubt that he might have been able to do that. That in the moment that he was in, uh, World Series, pressure on him, he'd been uh, brushed back by a pitch, that he was ready to put that ball in the outfield no matter what the other team did and that he could have in fact called it. The consensus among baseball historians is, sorry, that Ruth did not point to the bleachers. Uh, among all the sports writers who were there at, at the game, only Joe Williams wrote a story that day in which he talked about the called shot. The others who wrote the story could easily have picked up on it from Williams. Uh, and even Williams eventually backed away from the story, uh, saying that he had a distinct memory of, of Ruth making a gesture, but that he had doubts about what the gesture meant. Not that Ruth had anything to be ashamed of. If, and as Hartnett said, if he merely predicted the pitch on which he was going to hit the home run and never pointed to the spot, that's still a fitting capstone to his career. Did he call his shot? 
Or didn't he? Only one person knew for sure. The mighty Babe Ruth. Ever since the first Chinese explorers reached the west coast of America in 476 AD, a west coast populated by these tall redwoods, there have been reports of a race of giant hominids. Bigfoot, the abominable snowman, Yeti, Sasquatch. Particularly here in the Pacific Northwest, among the nation's great forest, the legend or reality persists. Many sightings, many footprints left behind. For years, there have been myths in the Pacific Northwest of a race of giant Indians, a race of giant people, and also of sort of wild men, of, of animal creatures that are of uh, enormous size. And this has essentially morphed into the Bigfoot legend. Um, sometimes Bigfoot is called Sasquatch. Where does that name come from? It comes from a Canadian newspaper reporter, J.P. Burns in the 1920s, basically coined that name, took it from an Indian word, uh, and, and, and he took a lot of these myths and legends and put them together and kind of created uh, this idea of this one creature that we think of. When we think of this creature, we think of a man, beast, seven feet tall, shaggy fur, um, and of course we've seen this all over in movies, in commercials, in all sorts of places. Does he really exist? Does Bigfoot really exist? Michael Newton is one of the world's leading experts on Bigfoot. He has written seven books on the subject. I tend to think that uh these creatures are some sort of undiscovered uh, ape or hominid. Um, one of the main theories is that it might be a surviving form of Gigantopithecus, the uh, prehistoric ape that stood 10 or 11 feet tall and that uh, could presumably have migrated from Asia over the Bering uh, land bridge the same time uh, that uh, what we now call Native Americans did. In the 1970s, World-renowned primatologist John Napier published a book containing the results of his investigation of the Bigfoot phenomena, Bigfoot, the Yeti and Sasquatch in Myth and Reality. Napier wrote, if we are to form a conclusion based on scant extant hard evidence, science must declare Bigfoot does not exist. But he also concluded, I am convinced that Sasquatch exists. But whether it is all it is cracked up to be is another matter altogether. There must be something in Northwest America that needs explaining, and that something leaves man-like footprints. These apparent contradictory remarks are derived from a few clear-cut cases that cannot be dismissed as hoaxes or illusions. As far as convincing evidence of Bigfoot, the uh, two that come to mind, one is the very controversial Patterson film that was shot in California in October 1967. It's the famous one that everybody's seen clips of. And uh, it's been analyzed by various anatomists and uh, specialists in hominoid locomotion. Uh, they've calculated the size of the creature, if it is in fact a creature. Uh, it's been analyzed by Hollywood uh, special effects teams who say that they couldn't fake the musculature underneath the uh, skin and the fur. On the other hand, you've had two or three different people that came forward and claimed that they were the man in the ape suit. Uh, at least two of them were promoted at different times by the same debunking author, which means that he, know, he knew he lied about at least one of them because there could not have been two men in the suit. 
Um, none of these stories by the alleged hoaxers have been convincing. Uh, they claim to have used uh, different kinds of ape suits. One guy claimed that the suit was made out of horse hair with a football helmet uh, covered with fur or mohair or whatever it was. And uh, another guy claimed he bought a Hollywood gorilla suit like you see in some of the old Three Stooges comedies. And none of them resemble the creature in the film. Uh, the other case from 1968 in Oregon uh, was a set of uh, footprints that actually included a crippled left foot. Uh, if you uh, take the cast of the foot and then draw over it the normal structure of an ape or a human foot with the different bones, you find that it appears to have been broken and healed in a crooked form so that it's almost hooked like this. And the idea that uh, anyone creating a fake set of feet would produce one crippled foot and then plant the tracks in such an obscure place that only a long-range hunter would find them, I think is really absurd. The scientific skeptic in us says Bigfoot is a myth. Bigfoot is, is something that we'd love to believe in. Bigfoot is a mythical, semi-mythical creature that we would love for it to be true. Unfortunately, from a kind of a scientific biological uh, viewpoint, it's not enough to say, oh, I have one photograph or I have some pictures, I have a little film. Because if for Bigfoot to be real, there'd have to be a lot of Bigfoots or Big Feet, if you will. I suspect that uh, some people, well, they do question why Bigfoot is not seen more often. Um, the answer to that, I would say, is that there have been over 4,000 reported sightings in the United States going back to 1735. So they are seen. Uh, the footprints have been found hundreds of times. Again, many of them, or some of them at least, are documented fakes, but they're easy to spot if you know what you're looking for. The shape of the foot never changes if it's a metal or a wooden foot. Uh, the footprints that are convincing, you see the toes change position as they walk, they dig in as the creature goes uphill, the foot flexes as it goes downhill, and so forth. Uh, there have also been discoveries on several continents of uh, unidentified hair that comes back testing as primate hair of an unknown species. Well, there you have it. The mystery of Bigfoot is waiting for you to take your camera into the great forests of the Pacific Northwest. Good luck. Can Hollywood celebrities get away with murder? In his day, Fatty Arbuckle was as big or even a bigger star than Robert Blake or O.J. Simpson. And like them, he faced a murder trial, the first of the big Hollywood murder trials. Roscoe Conkling Arbuckle was nicknamed Fatty because he was huge. His size made him perfect for the physicality of silent film comedies. An early pioneer of slapstick humor, he starred in Max Sennett's Keystone Cop series and shared the screen with other silent film legends, Charlie Chaplin, Harold Lloyd, and Buster Keaton. By 1919, he was making an astonishing million-dollar-a-year salary. In 1921, exhausted from the pace of churning out movies, Fatty Arbuckle needed a break. We had a big party in San Francisco over Labor Day weekend, and um, he had invited a lot of friends and starlets to come up. Uh, one of those starlets was a young girl whose name was Virginia Rapay. Uh, she had come to the party and had drank way, way too much. In fact, she ended up dying a few days later in the hospital from what the coroner said was a ruptured bladder. Now we have a death, maybe a murder. What actually happened 
at that riotous Hollywood party. She was completely drunk out of her mind, according to all the witnesses who were there at the time, uh, including even the hotel doctor who came up to examine her, said she was drunk, uh, and left. Now, she did have a number of medical problems anyway uh, prior to this and probably died from alcohol poisoning at this party. Um, unfortunately, one of the young women who was a friend of hers uh, looking for publicity blamed the whole thing on Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. I mean, it was his party. Um, stories began to circulate and Fatty became a really a victim of, of gossip. I mean, it was a you know, a lot of gossip that went around at the time. Uh, there were a lot of stories that claimed because he was such a big guy that he had uh, tried to rape her and being on top of her had caused her bladder to burst and that's what killed her. Uh, other, people's cl other people claimed that he raped her with a uh, champagne bottle. I, I think uh, the Fatty Arbuckle case was basically an ambitious uh, DA who wanted to be governor and uh, he happened on this case that allowed him to uh, make a big name on the uh, a Hollywood scandal. And Arbuckle was tried three times. Uh, the first two juries couldn't come to a decision. The third jury uh, acquitted him in one minute and spent the next five minutes of their deliberation writing an apology to him in the name of the American justice system. Of course, by that time he was ruined. But it appears that the victim was a heavy drinker with medical conditions that made it very unadvisable for her to drink. Apparently she'd recently had a rather clumsy abortion and during this party where she uh, suffered her final injury, it appears that there may have been some, well, may, more or less innocent horseplay that involved some kind of a impact to her abdomen. There were rumors that went around that his bosses at the studio, um, because he was making so much money, I mean, he was, uh, while not well remembered today, was in those days probably the most popular comedian in America. His movies were sellouts and he was making a huge salary. And uh, the story went around that, that there were people who were out to get him and that they fanned the flames of the press and really got people all worked up because um, it wasn't just the newspapers. I mean, once people saw some of the things that were going on in Hollywood at the time, um, it really got people into a moral outrage across the country and churches began talking about him from the pulpits and they began banning his movies and that kind of thing. So that's really what killed his career. Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle's career was ruined. But the truth of whether he ever played the role of a killer in real life, he took that to his grave after an untimely death at the age of 46. He is one of America's most famous geniuses, yet few in his own country know his name. He was the last of the great backyard inventors, following in the footsteps of Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell. Yet his accomplishments are barely mentioned in the history books. His research made possible the V-1 and V-2 rockets that mercilessly pounded London at the end of World War II. After the war, a reporter asked German rocket expert Werner von Braun how the Germans had developed such deadly weapons. A surprised von Braun answered in astonishment, don't you know about your own rocket pioneer? Dr. Goddard was ahead of us all. Robert Goddard did for rocketry what the Wright brothers did for the airplane. But at the same time, Goddard was a secretive man, a visionary well ahead of his time. He foretold of putting man in space, landing on the moon. And he figured out for all of us how to do that. And here is the strangest of the strange. The first liquid fuel rockets, rockets that could actually fly in space, were launched 
from Roswell, New Mexico. The very same Roswell, New Mexico, where an alien spaceship crashed in 1947, a mere 12 miles from Goddard's Rocket Launch Center. The story of how this eerie connection came about begins when Goddard was still a young man. By brilliantly calculating the energy-to-weight ratio of various fuels, Goddard discovered a rocket could fly in the vacuum of space. But more importantly, he determined that solid fuel, such as black powder, used in small rockets and fireworks, could not launch a large missile into outer space. For this kind of propulsion, he needed a liquid fuel, such as a liquid hydrogen-oxygen mixture, a mixture that combusted in the airless environment of space. Goddard figured this all out on his own, long before science fiction writers ever imagined spaceships traveling through the galaxy. Then on January 12, 1920, the front page of the New York Times proclaimed, Goddard believes rocket can reach moon. The story mentioned a proposal to send to the dark part of the new moon a sufficiently large amount of the most brilliant flash powder, which, in being ignited on impact, would be plainly visible in a powerful telescope. And even visible to others, searching the galaxy for signs of life. By 1929, Goddard was launching the world's first liquid-fueled rockets. But nearly out of money, he needed more funding to make good on his vision of a rocket to the moon. At wit's end, to complete his quest, he was unexpectedly visited by America's greatest hero, Charles Lucky Lindbergh. He confided to Charles Lindbergh that if he were given $25,000 a year for four years, he could accomplish in 48 months something that otherwise might take a lifetime. Lindbergh brought on board the mysterious financier David Guggenheim, who financed Goddard for the next decade. Now, Goddard could work in secrecy on rocketry full-time and on a large scale. But where to perform the work? Year-round weather led him to Roswell, New Mexico, a place, as his wife Esther would later remark, where we would not bother anyone and no one would bother us. There, in 1930, at the Mescalero Ranch, just east of Roswell, the Goddards and a crew of four set up their workshop. Later, they erected a launch tower on a secluded section of prairie. Over the next 12 years, Goddard and his crew made major strides in liquid fuel rocket propulsion. In all, there were 56 flight tests in Roswell, with 17 flights reaching to the edge of outer space. So, when people question what would an alien spaceship be doing hovering over Nowheresville, Roswell, New Mexico, there really is no better place for them to search out than the Goddard Space and Rocket Laboratory built only a decade before. the lab that said, we are ready to leave the planet. Here they are some of the world's greatest works of art. Rembrandt's, Vermeer, Manet, Degas, Gone Forever. All part of the greatest art heist in American history. 
in world history. A heist perpetrated in 1990, just as Boston St. Patty's Day festivities concluded. A heist that occurred in Boston's prestigious Isabella Gardner Museum. The biggest art heist in U.S. history at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. Paintings taken that were worth, I think today they'd be worth something like $300 million. If you go into the museum today, they just have empty frames on the walls where those paintings were. There were Rembrandts and Manets, all sorts of Degas, all sorts of famous uh, artists. It was um, an amazingly brazen robbery. The people who did it basically walked into the museum after 1 a.m. in the morning, f said they were policemen, duped the guard uh, to call the other guard. There were only two security guards. Uh, tied them up and in 81 minutes uh, ransacked the museum, took the paintings they wanted, left, and no trace of them has ever been found. Now, now there's a couple of interesting aspects to this story. One is the statute of limitations has run out. And the prosecutors and the law enforcement officials have said that they won't prosecute anybody who comes forward with the paintings. So if the thief had the paintings, he could walk into a police station in Boston today, put them down on the counter, and say, here they are. And yet, those paintings have never turned up. So um, it's a great mystery. There's a lot of weird parts of the story. The um, these guys were obviously kind of master criminals in the sense that they pulled this off, but they also didn't make a lot of effort to disguise their faces. The guards gave pretty good descriptions of them. Other people uh, outside saw them. And they took a sort of a almost random seeming collection of paintings. Where are those paintings? Are they hidden in some master art collector's hidden safe room in his, you know, island paradise getaway? Uh, nobody knows. It sounds like one of those thefts that would be uh, commissioned by a private collector, somebody very possibly outside the United States, a rich uh, sheik or someone in South America or uh, Asia with billions to spend that decided he wanted certain paintings to uh, hang on his wall in a vault and go sit there and uh, look at him while he's drinking a glass of Cristal some evening. But uh, almost impossible that they would ever surface again, certainly not for sale. I mean, it's not the kind of thing you could move. It'd be like stealing the Hope Diamond. You'd have to smash it to uh, ever uh, get rid of it on the open market. Will they ever turn up? And, and why did they take them in the first place? Did they take them to sell them? You know, there's a, um, it's funny, there's a very famous movie, it's been made twice, called The Thomas Crown Affair, about a very rich man who steals the painting uh, out of the museum in order to uh, basically prove that he can do it. Does it as a lark. And the original Thomas Crown Affair movie takes place in Boston. So, um, you know, is life imitating art? Is art imitating life? Who knows, but it's a fascinating story. One additional little mystery, the museum's most prized and valuable work, The Rape of Europa by Titian. Well, the two burglars left that one behind. I think scholars tend to to put Poe in a in a, in a light that um, those who, who sort of revere him don't really want to look at this really nasty, strange, mysterious way that he died. And so we often people aren't familiar with it. Uh, they really aren't familiar with the circumstances of his death uh, any more than they're familiar with the uh, the unsolved mystery of the Poe toaster. Um, and, and that sounds odd, but there has been since 1949 a man in black who appears at Poe's grave every year uh, on the anniversary of his birthday. Um, he leaves uh, roses and a bottle of cognac. Um, no one knows what these things mean. No one knows who he is. Edgar Allan Poe was America's first truly great writer. A man who produced writing for all ages and all times. He published his most famous poem, The Raven, 
in 1845. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Edgar Allan Poe lived for just 40 years. Best known for his poems and short fiction, he wrote in a style never before seen in America. Unique, independent, even eccentric. Edgar Allan Poe was an American original. Poe's life and writings were filled with paradox. He was basically insecure and highly emotional, but his writings were structured. His poetry and prose contained an apocalyptic sense of doom, but he combined this with the romantic innocence of childhood. But at last, he was on the way to fame and fortune. The story of Edgar Allan Poe's death um, really is, is sort of fitting when you think of this is the guy who created the American mystery uh, story uh, because he died and it's a great mystery surrounding it. We will never know for sure again what really happened, and, but there are a lot of theories. Um, Poe was actually traveling around the time of his death. He had left Baltimore by train, but somehow ended up back there. On October the 3rd, he was found um, deliriously, they assumed drunk, in a gutter in Baltimore. Um, he was not wearing his own clothing. He was carrying someone else's walking stick. Um, he was completely delirious, and he kept saying the name Reynolds over and over again, calling to someone named Reynolds. Now, as far as anyone who knew him knew, there was no one named Reynolds in his life. No one has any idea, and to this day, has no idea who this Reynolds might have been. Uh, Poe lingered in the hospital for about three days before he finally died on October 7th. Um, there have been a lot of questions as to what killed him. Uh, some people think he drank himself to death. Um, other people believe that he had uh, everything from rabies to brain fever to cholera. Um, there's been probably the most convincing evidence I've seen is that Poe was actually kidnapped. He was found dying on the eve of election day. And in those days, supposedly there was a process uh, called cooping that individuals would come around and dragoon uh, people by the cartload and would drive them from one polling place to the next, forcing them to change clothes as they go along and to vote repeatedly. And uh, some people say that uh, Poe, in a debilitated condition, uh, was swept up in one of these raids and forced to go around town voting over and over again. Uh, this has been used also to explain the fact why he was found in clothing, very obviously not his own, like the ha hat and coat and so forth that he had. Uh, didn't belong to him as far as anyone who knew him might have said. It's an interesting story and, and one I think, as I said, that's really fitting for a, a man who really created, you know, the American mystery as we know it to have died under such mysterious circumstances. Nothing farther than he uttered, not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered, other friends have flown before. On the morrow, he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, nevermore. And the voice of America's most original author was heard nevermore.